we have the world right here. We're connected to everybody everywhere in a digital Disneyland. But what does that do to our relationships with those people in our actual space? Too often those real people start to fade away from our awareness, replaced by pixelated surrogates that live in here. A consequence of connecting to tiny images and text in our devices is that we disconnect from those full-size, flesh-and-blood human beings around us. We sacrifice our authentic human experience, living our actual lives, for tweeting, texting, posting, Instagramming, liking, sharing a picture of someone else's virtual life. A recent article in the Chronicle of Higher Education told the story of an acting class where college students no longer understood how to flirt with each other. When asked to improvise a flirtation scene, they jumped right to simulated sex. <laughs> no subtlety, no nuance, no courtship ritual, no reading the come here or go away signals that either encourage or destroy intimacy. Imagine a world where college students don't know how to flirt with each other in an acting class. <laughs> the apocalypse surely can't be far behind. What may save us from a world where everybody looks here and nobody knows what this means is rethinking what to look for when we look here. <laughs> Improvisers and many theater professionals believe that reading each other's physical signals makes better theater because it's a richer, more symbiotic way to live. Those physical signals tell a story if you start to look. A solution to our collective disconnection might be start looking for the stories around us. Improvisers train to see story everywhere. We practice tuning in to other people. And while we're on the subject of improvisers and other people, please welcome to the stage two improvisers who are also other people, Dan O'Connor and Edie Patterson. With their help, we're gonna explore some of the techniques improvisers use, because I believe you will relate to the people around you differently more empathetically once you see the people in your environment as having stories. Improvisers make stories up out of nothing except what is right in front of them. And I found that this practice has made its way into my everyday life. I was at a car wash on a Friday afternoon. There's a man with his back towards me, his arms are crossed, he's leaning his hips against a post. He looks tense. <laughs> I'm thinking, what's his story? Maybe he's anxious. Maybe he wants to get his car washed in a hurry because he's got a hot Friday night date. <laughs> or maybe it's a brand new car and he's nervous. He wants to make sure that they don't scratch the paint. Or maybe his story is he's thinking how much better his car is than his cousin's car. And his tension is actually smugness. <laughs> Maybe he's thinking that at this week's family dinner, his newly washed, better than his cousin's, smart, stylish driving machine will be the ooh and ah topic of all of his nieces and nephews. <laughs> Those are my maybes. I don't know. I can't know. But I can let what I see suggest stories. And those stories create a sort of bond between myself and the fellow with his arms crossed. Well, it's really Dan. Hello, Dan. Hi, Brian. It's because I know I don't know that I don't judge him. Improvisers practice suspending judgment because we don't know who the characters in our stories are going to turn out to be. Dan's character might just drive off away into the sunset. <laughs> or he might save Edie from a charging bull elephant. <laughs> He'll be out for an hour. Let's go have lunch. Great, sounds okay, good. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> I don't know. We can't know. All I can do is suspend judgment, look at what's in front of me, and imagine. The job is to figure out the figure. So that's what I focus on. Here's a simple way to practice this. You can play this at home with your friends. Edie is going to make an intentionless gesture away from her body, and Dan will join whatever story he sees. Hold on, hold on to the railing. <sighs> They're putting a net underneath you. You'll be fine. Oh, I don't know how much longer I can hold on, George. 
Let go. You'll be caught. By you? By the net. Ah! Flick him. Thanks. Sure, no problem. And now Dan will make a gesture away from his body, and Edie will join that story. Good, good. Now the other karate guy's gonna come right at you. You give him your flat hand, and then a good karate kick. <laughs> Was that right? That's right. Okay, fantastic. As your sensei, I'm passing you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Keith Johnstone, in his book, Impro, calls the game we've been playing blind offers. The gesture is an offer. And because there's no intention behind it, it's blind. The person making the offer isn't wanting their partner to guess, hey, I'm pouring a glass of Sauvignon Blanc, do you get it? You're making an open-ended offer, and you're, you're hoping your partner will define you. John Stone says that everything that happens on stage is an offer. If I walk over here and do nothing, Dan and EDC, even this is an offer, and we'll come join the story. Are you gonna have a shootout right here in the middle of Main Street, Luke? Yeah, is it gonna be a shootout? <sighs> yeah. Soon as that clock hits noon, my finger is automatically gonna go to the trigger oh. and shoot at whatever's in front of me, even though there's nothing there. How you feeling, Billy? You feeling good about your shooting scales? I feel confident and completely overreactive. All right, <laughs> we're gonna get out of the way in case someone shoots back. Oh. <laughs> so because we're improvising, we don't know what's gonna happen. Mistakes happen all the time, but the beauty of improvisation is that mistakes are not only acknowledged as part of the process, they're also encouraged and incorporated. Engaging with the people around us in this imaginative way moves us from our isolated, siloed, individual story into a shared story. We connect with and interpret the world around us by figuring out the figures around us. The stories that these figures inspire are fluid. So the challenge is to move with the changes in story the way that uh, surfers move with a wave. This next game demonstrates how to stay flexible even when the story wave is constantly moving and surprising. And speaking of surprises, could we have two audience members on stage join us for this <laughs> next game? We promise you won't have to say anything. You'll just have to do a little tapping of Dan and Edie. It's very, yes, we have two people down here. Guys, we have two people right down here. George and Taylor, everybody. Hey, come on out. So come on in, George and Taylor. You're going to play a game called Moving Bodies with Dan and Edie. Edie, come on down front. Great. So you can position these guys any way you want to, and they'll hold that position. So if you move Dan's arm like this, go ahead, Taylor, go ahead, move Dan a little bit gently. <laughs> George, move Edie. Now move them in ways that you actually move physically. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have any double-jointed special parts. They're human beings just like you, so move them in a way you'd like to be moved in public. Yeah, okay. That's good. And uh, remember, if you, if you break them, you buy them. And they're very expensive improvisers. All right, so uh, <laughs> this is great. You guys just created some art there. Thank you. Yeah. So Dan and Edie need to adjust to the physical offers they get from their movers. Their story will have to adapt to what their bodies are doing. And to get us started, could we have a... Uh, a place two people might meet. Yeah. Where? Disneyland. Disneyland, I heard. Thank you very much. All right, yes, go to town. You can move, us, move them wherever you want. Wow, the happiest place on earth, Dolores. So huh. exciting, Todd. It's, I'm, I'm taller than this sign. <laughs> Great, that means you can ride the ride. <laughs> yeah, first I want to stretch a little bit. You know, oh. like it's a little cramp on Space Mountain, so I just need to, you know, open up my chakras. Todd, look, uh. it, it looks like the top of Space Mountain has the cars on it, oh. like, like some cars are stuck up I, there. I have a short attention span. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi. I figure this is a great place to dance in the middle of Main Street. <laughs> Why not? Sure. Oh, your heart's beating so fast. Well, it, it's, it, I'm, I'm feeling sick because I'm going to propose to you. Great, let's stop it there. Thank you, George and Taylor. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. 
So you can see how that game trains you to be flexible, figuring out the figure, even when the figure is moving like some mind-altered mime at an after party at Burning Man. <laughs> flexible figures. And also shifting context. You've got to, as an improviser, be moving with your story all the time, even when the context shifts. Let's go back to Dan at the car wash. Let's keep the same body language, but let's change the context. He won't be at a car wash anymore. Earlier, you filled out some slips of paper, and we put them in a basket with uh, playwrights and movie styles. Edie's going to pick one, and that context is going to drive the story of Dan's figure in this next improvisation. This is oh, terrible. Pressure's on. <clears throat> Romantic comedy. I don't know if you wanted that read out loud. But. Yeah, it's good. No, I did, actually. Thank you. Chad, please, don't be mad. Look, I had to talk to him on the phone. We dated for a long time. I don't love him anymore. Are you sure you, you don't have feelings for him anymore? Yeah, I'm sure. He was awful. I'm with you now. Well, I want to show you this. I painted your name on the side of this building. Oh. <laughs> Chad, it's... and obviously you came here early this morning and rigged up a lot of curtains. Yes. Yes, I wanted to make... I spelled your name in Skittles in case you wanted to eat the wall. I know they're your favorite candy. It means so much to me. It means so much to me that you mean so much to me. <laughs> oh, Chad. Yay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll do one with Dan now, and my card says documentary. <laughs> so get back to you. Mm. After he had moved to the corner office, Mr. Bronstein found that there was a view that was unexpected to him. This view is unexpected. <laughs> We interviewed him about how he felt to be in an office which had not met the expectations. Mr. Bronstein, what is it about this office that uh, surprised you? Uh, just the view was completely unexpected. <laughs> I thought I was in the southeast corner. And this looks more northwest. What is it about the northwest corner that is maybe upsetting or unnerving to you? As a child, I was made to face northwest most of the time. <laughs> childhood, childhood photos of Mr. Bronstein facing northwest as a child. <laughs> Home movies of Mr. Bronstein riding his tricycle as a child looking to the northwest. <laughs> Do you feel like it made you more successful? Yes, yes, making me face the direction I don't want to face has changed the entire course of my life. Thank you. There's, that's something that a lot of people can take away. I, I I'm glad we made this documentary, because yes. now I know why I made it. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to raise the bar. We're going to have Dan and Edie turn their backs to each other. They're going to come up with a physical activity on their own, unbeknownst to their partner. When I say go, they'll face each other, and they'll have to connect those physical activities to one another. They'll have to figure out the figure that's in front of them and find the connection to that, and also to what is on this card. Impossible, you say. Ridiculous. It can't be done. Watch and wonder as they do a non... We just did documentary. This is nonfiction. I'm going to pick something that is not real. Isn't all of this nonfiction, Brian? It is. Oh. This is Wes Anderson. <clears throat> God. I was just writing a letter to your cat. Great. My cat's ready to hear your letter. It's, it's about, you know, making sure that your cat gets nourishment and the way that you move just like your cat. Have you drawn any old timey navigational instruments on this letter? I have. And if you follow the navigation, you'll find yourself going through an unnamed Eastern European country in the 30s. Sounds great. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I love how context informs how we interpret the figure. Our brains are hardwired to make associations between the figure and whatever else surrounds that shape in space. A certain figure on a city street at night might inspire a story in your brain of danger, threat, criminality. But that same figure in the molecular biology section of the public library 
might entice your brain to create a story of an eccentric genius who's about to cure cancer. Our brain figures out the figure based on what surrounds the figure. For our last game, uh, we're going to do a scene that combines context and figure and moves the story on a timeline. And speaking of moving, could we have a person move up out of their seat onto the stage? <laughs> One person, maybe the woman who wanted to come yes. up earlier. Yeah. <laughs> She's going to come to the stage and we're going to do a, a scene called a growing and shrinking machine. It's going to start with a single scene with Edie and then Dan or I will yell freeze and come into the scene and create a new two person scene based on that physicality. And then the third person will come in, we'll make a three person scene that's different. What's your name? And then Sarah. our volunteer, Sarah. Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Welcome. Sarah, when you see the three of us in an interesting physical position, yell freeze, figure out the figure, define us through a line of dialogue so that we know where we are, and say anything. As you can see, we're saying anything in these <laughs> improvisations. And then uh, after you've come in and we've established it, find a reason to leave, they'll shrink back to the three-person scene, then the two-person scene, and then the one-person scene. So you only have to come in, say a line of dialogue, and then find a reason to leave. Let's give Sarah a hand for being yeah. game and volunteering. So we're going to create three different scenes, and then all, all of us together, you can come in. So to start ED off, could we have an occupation, please? Lawyer, I heard. Thank you. All right. Got to write up this deposition, because that's what lawyers do. They handwrite depositions. <laughs> <sighs> Okay, I'm just gonna sign my name here. That's the thing that'll make it official. And very lawyerly. Now I'm gonna mail it to the courthouse. Freeze. Well, what does the will say? What did they leave our family? I hate to say it, Bobby, but I've gotten everything. I know you're my brother and it's not fair, but I've got the house, the pool, the horses, all of it. Candace, You've only rejoined our family in the last month when you discovered mom was your birth mother. Freeze, freeze, freeze. Sarah, are you serving John the last piece of cake? Oh. I Yay, cake! <laughs> Yay! You know, why don't, uh, why don't the two of you split it? I'll just put it right Come here. Come on, Roger! <laughs> uh, that's all right, kid. You have the cake. Freeze. You're murdering someone together. So, Caesar got it from here. Oh. Uh, uh, Thanks, boss. Rome is free. <laughs> well, uh, I drew the short straw. That means he gets all the cake. That means he gets, he gets all the cake. I'll Yay! Be, I be, get all the cake. All right, all right. I'll be outside weeping. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, take a look. It says it right there. Oh, I wish I brought my. Will reading glasses. These are my distance glasses. Oh, yes, I see. You're right. Yeah, um, it, you know, it doesn't really matter if you can see it or not. Your name is nowhere on it. I'm going to go live under a bench. <clears throat> All right. See ya. Okay. Oh, return deposition. Just like important lawyers always get in the mail. <clears throat> and I'll just sign that. Send it back, and we should go to trial in about four days, because that's how the law works. <laughs> yeah, <that's it. laughs> Thank you, Sarah. This game teaches us to make story choices quickly as a group, to justify an environment that doesn't really make sense. Ever feel like the world around you doesn't really make sense? Practicing these games, I believe, will help you to be able to be able to relate to an environment that's chaotic and volatile and be relaxed about it. Uh, to be able to um, suspend your judgment and to be able to connect to the stories of the figures around you. So that perhaps next time when you're in line at a drugstore and somebody is rude to you, you'll step back, take a moment, figure out the figure, and wonder what their story might be. Because Maybe they've been up all night at the hospital with a sick friend, and they're just not feeling very good right now getting the medication. Or maybe they had to put something back on the shelf because they couldn't afford everything in their basket. Or maybe 
They're just rude. Yeah. It could happen. I don't know. We can't know. All we can do is look at what's around us and imagine. Or we could just go back to our phone and wait for the people in the drugstore to disappear from our awareness. The choice is yours. You can either see the world here through stories that are coded and created, decided and delivered, or you can experience the world through the stories that are happening live around you. Look up.